April the 25th, 1915, men of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps landed at Gallipoli. It was on that day the traditions of our fighting forces were born. These stories of their sons and daughters at war we proudly dedicate to the memory of Anzac. of the Solomon Islands, where the Japanese advance southward towards New Zealand was finally halted, men of many races and lands joined in the first Allied offensive of the Pacific War. These tough warriors of the 1st Fijian Battalion, officered largely by New Zealanders, fought with the 3rd New Zealand Division, beside Americans and Australians in the grim and bloody Solomon's campaign. This is a story of cooperation and of New Zealand's most colourful battalion, the 1st Fijian. So expert was the Fijian jungle craft that casualties like this were rare. In their first two months in action, they killed 125 Japanese for the loss of one man. By early 1942, the Japanese had swept down the Pacific and established a strong forward base at Rabaul in New Britain. To protect this base, they occupied the Solomon Islands. In August 1942, in their first offensive action of the war, United States Marines landed on Guadalcanal. This was to be the spearhead of the Allied drive. The Australian cruiser Canberra formed part of the escort for the convoy carrying the Marines to the assault on Guadalcanal. With her were HMAS Australia and American warships. Canberra helped to cover the landings, but disaster was approaching. A Japanese naval force caught the Allied warships by surprise. was mortally hit and in less than five minutes was out of action. Canberra was on fire with her ammunition blowing up and 84 of her crew dead. An American destroyer took off survivors and sank her with a torpedo. United States Marines had landed successfully on Guadalcanal and Tulagi in the first amphibious operation undertaken by the United States since 1898. It was the beginning of six months of savage fighting. In the first landings, the Japanese defenders had been taken by surprise and overwhelmed, but they quickly rallied and put up a desperate resistance. Marine reinforcements were rushed to Guadalcanal. Later, an army division, the 25th, reinforced the hard-fighting Marines. In a desperate attempt to supply the starving defenders, Japanese warships threw food stores into the sea in waterproof containers, hoping they would float ashore. Most of these stores fell into the hands of the Americans. Ashore, the advancing troops captured large stocks of rice and barley, which became useful rations for the native laborers. The work done by the Solomon Islanders was soon speeded up when modern mechanical equipment was landed. <laughs> 
valuable prize of war was this Japanese refrigerating plant. Henderson Field was Guadalcanal's only airstrip. Now planes of the Royal New Zealand Air Force were using it to ferry supplies from New Zealand. Guadalcanal, with the remnants of the Japanese garrison withdrawn by sea, had become the base for the 3rd New Zealand Division's forthcoming campaigns to the north. As well as supplies, the planes brought welcome mail from home. These came out of the oven only the day before. The New Zealand Air Force operated from New Georgia Island too, between Guadalcanal and Bougainville. These Kitty Hawks, escorting American dive bombers, carry an extra petrol tank for the long trip to Rabat. As the war in the Solomons approached a new climax, the fighter wing redoubled its efforts. The ground staff worked two 12-hour shifts a day to keep their planes in the air. Not so many Jap Zero fighters about at this stage, but the 57 flags tell their own story. The New Zealand wing was employed constantly on raids on enemy supply dumps hidden in the jungle. Some of the results were spectacular. Florida Island had seen its share of the fighting too, but now it was returning to its peaceful ways. There was opportunity for the time-honored Kaaba ceremony. Fijian scouts served the Kaaba, made from the chewed roots of the pepper plant, to one of their officers, who shows that he knows the rules of the ceremony. For the embattled New Zealanders, Florida Island was a welcome source of fresh fruit supplies. Now, from Guadalcanal, the Allies moved closer to the main Japanese base at Rabaul. Allied forces landed on Bougainville Island. They went ashore at Empress Augusta Bay and captured Torakina Airstrip. On Bougainville, men of the 1st Fijian Battalion were fighting an enemy who preferred death to surrender. It was a grim war of patrol and ambush and sudden sharp encounter. Commanding the Fijian Battalion was Colonel Upton of Auckland. American Negroes of the 93rd Division fought beside the New Zealanders and Fijians. They move up for an attack on a Jap position. The far bank of the river is held by the enemy, and the soldiers crouch tensely as their officer probes the enemy strength. They give covering fire, while with grenades and carbine, the officer wipes out a Japanese post and signals his men to cross the river. run into trouble and the Fijians move in to support them. News comes that a Fijian force has been cut off and a fighting patrol sets off to rescue their mates. With them, there's a New Zealand cameraman. The shell-torn jungle offers scant cover. The Japs are close, but they're well hidden. 
heavy on the Fijian soccer casualties. Another Fijian is severely wounded. They've suffered losses, but they've upheld their reputation as the toughest jungle fighters in the Pacific. Operating from Bergenville now is number one group RNZAF, which has under its command number 84 wing RAAF. Pilots receive a briefing for an attack. In the last 24 hours, the Japanese reserve troops rise overland from the east coast. Concentrations are situated in the trees about 400 yards inland. The aircraft will follow one another in at three minute intervals. Out of bombs from 800 feet. German war force, torpedo and dive bombers will be operating over area-wide. In the shadow of a volcano on an improvised airstrip, the planes are prepared for action. The fighter bombers are ready now for the crews, fueled, bombed up, ready for their mission. The Rabaul run is a familiar one by now, but there's tension in every operational tech. This time, as well as jungle targets, the Japanese base at Rabaul will be hit hard. On the way, enemy positions commanding Buka Passage between Bougainville and Buka Island are attacked. And now the target is the Japanese airstrip at Rabaul. them they leave a fiery trail of death and destruction. To avoid being blown up by their own bomb blast, they drop parachute bombs with delayed action fuses. 
enemy planes has been destroyed on the ground. Another heavy blow has been struck at the waning Japanese power in the southern Pacific, and victory in the long and hard-fought Solomon's campaign has been brought a step nearer. Torakina, this open-air picture show, used to be watched from the hills around by starving Japanese troops. Now the Japanese have been driven inland. For New Zealand airmen, the island war has been a harsh test, which they have passed with flying colours. Four Australian troops of the third, commanded by General Bridgeford, arrived at Bougainville to relieve the Americans and New Zealanders. Their task was to clear the enemy out of Bougainville was a tougher task than was realized. The Australians thought they were faced by only some 17,000 Japanese. In fact, there were still almost 40,000 enemy soldiers on the island. For the outnumbered Australians, a bitter and rugged campaign lay ahead. Relieved by the Australians, it was now time for the Fijian battalion to return home. Their voyage took them to New Zealand and then on to Suva Harbour, Fiji. There, welcome and peace were awaiting the homecoming veterans of the 1st Fijian battalion. Husbands, brothers and friends, they've been long away. Now, as in olden times, they prepared a traditional welcome for the returning warriors. The governor of Fiji, Sir Philip Mitchell, and Ratu Salala Sukuna, one of the highest of their chiefs, welcomed them. The governor and brigadier Ditna greeted Colonel Upton, and Ratu Sukuna shook hands with the men. Many of the battalion's officers were New Zealand. For the men of the 1st Battalion, this was a moment long awaited. They'd been soldiering in the Solomons for 16 months and had covered themselves with glory. Now at last they were home again. They drove through the streets of Suva, Fiji's capital city, on their way to their camp, and the people lined the streets to watch them with pride and thanksgiving. Their womenfolk brought them gifts. Their first meal on home soil was the same old army fare from the same old Dixies, but, as every soldier knows, Homecoming gives everything a new flavor. At last, their weapons were laid aside. Now there were new faces to get acquainted with. There's something about a soldier. and something special about a sergeant. <laughs> 
They had tales to tell these seasoned warriors of battle and ambush and sudden death. And there was no lack of enthralled listeners of all ages. So it had always been when the fighting men of the tribe came back from the wars. The women returned to their villages to prepare a traditional welcome for their men. Ratu Sakuna's home presented a peaceful scene, far removed from the war. Lieutenant Israeli Karura Burabura was an honored guest. This gallant officer had toiled through the Bougainville jungle for three weeks without food. For five days he carried an American airman on his back. He and his pilot had crashed after guiding bombers to an enemy position located by Fijian patrols. With Bougainville and the Japanese behind them, these soldiers found the nearest thing to war on the football field. There was even a casualty. Football was something at which they excelled, as Australians and New Zealanders have reason to know. Taro root, their favorite vegetable. It was good to see it again. Some of the men of the battalion lived on smaller islands of the Fiji group and had a further journey to make before they reached their homes. Ratu Sukuna and New Zealand officers bade them Godspeed. On the island of Lao, preparations were made for a feast of welcome. No feast was complete without a turtle. A roast ox was not exactly traditional fare, but it made good eating. Army trucks carried the soldiers on the last stage of their long journey home. There were glad reunions of families and friends. As part of the tribal ceremony of welcome, the village women brought gifts of hand plaited kava mats. Dance was the highlight of the welcome to the warriors home from the wars. In its formalized movements, unchanged from the days when war was waged with clubs and spears, it expressed the pride and joy of the tribe in the prowess of its fighting men. important Fijian function is held without the ancient kava ritual. The first cup from the kava bowl goes to the highest chief present. The men of the Fijian battalion, as guests of honor, drank from the kava bowl after the chief. Now the men, abandoning the traditional dancers, created new dances in honor of the great occasion. At the last, the soldiers themselves took part in the dance, clad in symbolic costumes. In their dance, they mimed the battles they had fought on Bougainville. Some of the soldier spectators, the dancers had special significance. 
It was a dance of victory. With their New Zealand comrades, they had shown that the fighting men of the South Pacific were amongst the finest in the world. 